Welcome back. Um, this is the uh, research abstracts session um, with the chair, Professor David Lee, Professor of Blockchain at Singapore University of Social Sciences. Um, welcome, Professor Lee, um, and uh, welcome to everyone else on the panel. I will um, ask you all to introduce yourselves, uh, if you would, uh, briefly. Um, over to you, Professor Lee. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm based in Singapore, so it's now about six o'clock. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here uh, for the JBBA event. It's always uh, you know, a great honor to be here. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself and perhaps I would like to, um, okay, I can't share screen here, so I would not, uh, I can share my screen here. So um, this this is my, uh, if you can see my screen, uh, this is the uh, my LinkedIn profile. So you're most welcome uh, to connect with me on LinkedIn. And regularly I post uh, research and also uh, interesting topics on my LinkedIn, uh, together with uh, Nassim and Murid. Um, there are a lot of information that uh, we provide on LinkedIn that uh, is usually very interesting for us to hear your feedback as well. So that's something that I would like to hear from you, especially comments to some of the posting that we have when we post the latest. Uh, this is um, where I'm involved in. This is the university that I'm involved in. It's known as Singapore University of Social Sciences, one of the three universities that I'm very active with. And we have recently set up a note for inclusive fintech. And you can see that the name has got NFT there. So it's very much uh, blockchain based and the I stand for inclusive. And we welcome any of you uh, from um, a British Blockchain Association or who are listening in to provide feedback and also uh, help us in getting the gender inclusive fintech going uh, either in Asia, in Europe or in America. So I would like to welcome any of you to join us uh, in this uh, movement towards uh, inclusive fintech. And I've also helped out with the Global uh, Fintech Institute, uh, which helped with uh, uh, central banks in especially in asia uh, and also try to lever off the education agenda to have inclusive education uh, for central banks as well as for corporates and also uh, regional uh, uh, individuals who are interested in fintech and hopefully uh, they could uh, bring uh, a level playing field in terms of uh, in, in education but uh, with the last two minutes, I want to just mention a little bit about what is happening in Singapore over the last one or two months. One is uh, non-fungible tokens. And uh, there, there are questions at the parliament, and this is the answer by our minister, Taman, about NFTs. Clearly, NFTs is not regulated at the moment in Singapore, but perhaps in the future, uh, and it is, a capital gains also is not uh, being taxed. There's no capital gains tax in Singapore, but if it's your main activities in your individual uh, income, then it's also taxable. So this is some of the new things that's happening in Singapore. And there's an update on the Payment Services Act of 2019 uh, on stable coin and so on this is something that i want to share with you hopefully you can see it oops not this one uh, but this one yeah so this is a payment services act this there's a document there that uh, is very useful on many fronts and it goes on with the latest development in singapore from 2019 to 2022 march the latest update is in march so you could see that the new payment system being uh, introduce and the act for Singapore and there are many many questions there about licensing and activities including stable coins and so on uh, this is the latest update on Singapore besides the Omibus Act that will give us a little bit more idea of how uh, well 
almost like a new token law and token regulation, token legislation that will be introduced to Singapore in the near future. But we are still at the stage of consultation. So you are most welcome to contribute to the development of the Umibus Act in Singapore and also to contribute to the payment act, which is continuously being updated. So your input uh, through the blockchain, uh, British Blockchain Association uh, will be very, interest very interesting for us in Singapore. So for that, uh, uh, I think my five minutes is up and I would then, uh, I suppose I would now invite the first speaker and the agenda today is that we have three speakers on their abstract. Each of them will have 10 minutes. So perhaps we can ask Mr. Colin Callinan to start off with his presentation of his abstract. Over to you, Colin. Thank you, Professor. And thank you for inviting me to speak here today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, my name is Colin Callan. Um, I am a researcher based in the west of Ireland and attached to the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. Um, this research concerns blockchain adoption in the fishery supply chain in Ireland. So the agenda for the next few minutes is really, I'm gonna give you a background in, to our institution and the context for this research. Then I'm gonna give you an overview of the outcome of our findings of the this research um, about blockchain and fishery supply chain, and then look at the adoption factors and emerging themes. So the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology is a third level institute um, of education based across five separate locations in the west of Ireland. And I'm a researcher attached to the Blockchain Research Centre. So there are a number of different disciplines involved in this research centre but primarily the focus is on marine, agriculture, supply chain, and business. So this research is concerned with identifying um, the factors that would enable blockchain adoption across uh, fishery supply chain in Ireland. And how this came about was through a lack of research that was an, uh, an identification of a lack of research being conducted in this area. Now, there is quite a lot of research coming out in the last year at an academic level about blockchain in supply chain, but there still is a paucity of research examining um, blockchain adoption in the fishery supply chain. So just a quick overview of the Irish uh, uh, seafood industry. So it's quite unique at a, at a European level in the sense that there is a diversity of vessel types and fishing techniques. So there are a number of large players like cooperatives, um, lobby groups, processors, and so on. But there are also a lot of small independent fishers out there as well. So the market is heavily segmented. And because of this segmentation, it makes the supply chain extremely complex. There are differing firm level organizational structures and the aquaculture production is quite different as well. Um, because Ireland is an island, the geographic locations um, are quite remote as well, which makes um, the supply chain even more complex. So this research really started with um, this team conducting a structured literature review to identify the blockchain adoption factors. Um, and I used the traditional information systems lens of the technological organization and environmental framework. I added in other individual and task related factors as well. This enabled us then to um, conduct a thematic analysis to identify enablers and barriers. And the outcome of this, um, I'll speak about in a few minutes. So we were able to identify um, a number of application areas uh, for blockchain in the fishery supply chain. So a lot of these are quite heavily weighted around operations, um, supply chain management and so on. But there are some quite interesting outcomes. Um, Quite obviously, recording, tracking, and sharing information is a key um, application area, but also efficiency um, gains around reduced paperwork and costs, information management as well. So big benefits, I think, around supply chain management as well, around governance structure, visibility, optimization, and demand forecasting, 
Um, auditing and fraud detection as well was a key outcome around um, transparency, traceability. Um, it's important to realize and to mention that the uh, fisheries industry in the European Union is heavily regulated. So um, auditability, uh, traceability and transparency are very, very um, useful. Um, so moving on quickly to the adoption factors identified. Um, so there are a number of them across um, the technological organization and environmental areas, and they're quite broad in some cases. Um, so a lot of the um, research emerging in this area looked at technological costs, um, security concerns, um, complexity, privacy, and uh, integration. Um, concerns around organizational readiness, um, the support level from top management, how technologically ready an organization would be, and uh, business model readiness. From the environmental um, uh, view, policy and re regulatory uh, concerns are key, competitive pressures, collaboration efforts, and government support. Now, this is a preliminary piece of research. And I've already moved on to the second stage um, where I've begun interviewing a number of different players along the supply chain. And it's quite interesting that what they're saying is starting to match uh, the outcomes from the literature review. So a number of the um, larger producer organizations um, are stating that one of the key adoption factors for them would be governmental support, clear policy and uh, regulation. From an individual and task related, these primarily um, are concerned with the technological aspect of blockchain adoption. So the expectations around the technology, um, the influence of your peers and how you would um, use the technology, the fit for the actual organization, um, the technological fit, the usability um, standards and the complexity involved. Now, through the identification of these adoption factors, um, I employed a text analytics uh, piece of software to identify key themes around enablers and barriers to adoption. So with enablers, there were six key themes and they're um, weighted in, a different, in different ways. So the heaviest weighted one is um, that of resources. Um, so this concerned really technological infrastructure, um, training and education and financial. Governmental then was the next heavily weighted enabling factor. And this re was related to collaboration between industry and government, development of regulations and policy. Um, the next one was support, and this related to managerial support and vendor support. Visibility, of course, is related to transparency and tracking. And business was quite interested because this, um, the outcome of this was the choice of business partner as an enabler to blockchain adoption transaction cost reduction and the enablement of new business models. The final one then is management, and this was related to the degree of management involvement and management support. So the enablers were quite um, uh, narrow, but they were quite um, uh, heavily weighted, whereas the opposite was the case with barriers. They were quite broad and um, more spread out. Um, I, I think this really signifies the issues around the technological adoption in this um, particular industry. The central theme for barriers was um, integration. So this was linked to other barriers and encompassed um, acceptance by partners, costs, return on investment, scalability, uh, standards, and the lack of knowledge around the technology. The next one was regulatory, and this this related to regulatory clarity and uncertainty around regulatory developments. After that, then costs were, were related to general costs, implementation costs. Stakeholder then refers to industry resistance, collaboration, hesitation, and differences with your industry partners. Legal related to future legal implications and the uncertainty around uh, current legalities. Um, complexity was related to technology and an increased coordination demand, um, scalability related to resources, implementation costs, and uncertainty again was around legal, technological, and regulatory. There were concerns around interoperability, um, interoperability specifically across jurisdictions, uh, reluctance to change, uh, the current systems being employed, 
And with technology, of course, there was unfamiliarity, unclear benefits of it, and a lack of, and just a general lack of knowledge about it. Um, infrastructure was related to existing and needed infrastructure. And finally, expertise um, related to existing knowledge. So this was the first stage of uh, a large research project of which I've just started to conduct um, expert interviews. And following that, um, I'm going to run some focus groups with people involved in the blockchain Ireland outside of fisheries, um, primarily with um, uh, Irish industry leaders in the area. So I want to thank you for your attention and I'd welcome any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you very much, Colin. I think it's a very, very interesting project. Uh, especially for livestock and fisheries and uh, many other areas for blockchain application and certainly trace and transparency, traceability and transparency uh, will be the key thing to build the trust in the industry. So I saw a lot of factors there and the barriers. So my concern is about barriers. I suppose in terms of technology, you have to use a lot of other technology rather than um, um, blockchain for example iot qr codes or whatever with livestock i think if it's perishable the, the issue is, is is major as well you talk about stakeholders as well uh the market structure is again major hindrance and so on but there's interoperability standardization i hear all those keywords but my question to you is that uh, from your research up to date among all the barriers how would you rank the one that is the major barrier the three major barriers uh, for the adoption for uh, this the, this um, convergence of technology, especially using blockchain for livestock and especially in fishery. Um, I, I think really the literature review identified integration and regulatory concerns. So technological integration and regulatory concerns around um, support from government and the law now it's interesting because i've started the next stage of data collection the heaviest one coming back is around regulatory support so the irish players in the industry um uh, keep emphasizing the over regulation of the industry and the the costs that are associated with this at an irish and european level so uh, their concern really um is around support from the eu and and the irish government um, around this so they're quite interestingly the irish fishers are quite technologically enabled and they're quite happy to adopt new technologies but they need to see a return on investment so what they see every year is increased costs um, decreasing margins on their products so they're concerned about this so it's interesting that the the literature review is is somewhat matching the the, the next stage of data collection so i, I think regulatory is the key one that's, that's very interesting. So market structure seem less concerned, given given Ireland, uh, which is a, a, a major problem for a lot of places. I, mm -hmm. I'm not too sure whether there are anyone with any questions. Uh, I think it's a very interesting presentation. Anyone would like to have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, maybe at the end of it, when we have more time. So thank you very much, Colin. That was something that uh, I personally uh, is very interested. Uh, very interested in, in the area i hope we can talk more about it later uh because of time constraint i'm going to move on to dr sarah harani uh, over to you sarah for your presentation thank you very much professor um and thank you very much um for inviting me for this presentation i'm just going to share my screen now Are you able to see my screen? Um, not yet. Yes, we are able to see it now. Perfect. Well, I, I just wanted to thank everyone um, for um, uh, inviting me to this presentation and to this conference. And um, I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing such a successful um, event. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about uh, um, blockchain um, from a legal perspective. I'm a senior lecturer in law, so 
I'm going to talk to you about blockchain arbitration and whether it's a forum for improving access to justice. To what extent does it improve access to justice? Now, perhaps you might not know this if you're not working in the legal field, but recently, especially in the past five years, I'd say, we've seen an explosion in interest in blockchain, particularly for dispute resolution. So blockchain has obviously been quite interesting on the fintech side and in terms of cryptocurrency, crypto assets, NFTs. Um, but I think that not a lot is known about blockchain as, as basically a technology to be used in dispute resolution. And the reason why I'm focusing on arbitration is because arbitration is the most popular method for resolving disputes in private commercial disputes. So this is what I'm going to focus on in my presentation. But just before I get into that, um, I just wanted to give you a small historical background about the deployment of technology in dispute resolution. So it hasn't always been just in arbitration. So in the 90s, you are perhaps familiar with eBay and PayPal as platforms. Um, they were the first platforms to introduce something called online dispute resolution. Um, which is basically um, an online platform where you go and resolve your disputes if you have a dispute with the person you've entered into a transaction with. And a few years after, we started seeing the spread of ODR, online dispute resolution, uh, to civil um, justice systems. And especially in the pandemic, this has received quite a big push. Um, and for example, um, one of the first uh, platforms or online dispute resolution platforms that were state um, supported was the EU ODR um, platform. But then after the pandemic, we obviously saw that push that I was talking to you about. And for example, now most civil court systems are working on reforms to, intr to introduce remote um, arbitration uh, to re remote uh, civil court um, hearings. But this has also meant that arbitration itself has also received this push during the pandemic. So before, um, I would say that the arbitration community was much more reticent towards technology, especially for um, using it as a platform um, for um, the proceedings themselves. So now we are seeing a lot of interest in new technologies such as blockchain and AI. And today I'm obviously talking to you about blockchain-based arbitration. So why blockchain-based arbitration? Um, well, it has been proposed by a number of platforms. So we've seen a number of platforms that have been created in the past 10 years, I'd say. And these platforms are proposing for the use of this technology for resolving disputes. So the question is why? Well, one of the proposed um, working examples of blockchain-based arbitrations, obviously to resolve cryptocurrency disputes. Um, another one that is not very well known or not very popular at the moment is using it in uh, the resolution of supply chain management disputes, like you can see here on, on this slide. So if blockchain, obviously in the form of smart contract is used um, in supply chain management, then arbitration can be inserted as a code um, in the form of online dispute resolution. Um, Sarah, your to slides resolve are not moving. Sarah, your slides are not moving. Oh, aren't they? That's it. How about now? Yeah, yep, no, now I'm moving sorry. now. <laughs> right. So blockchain arbitration is something new. So this means that we currently don't have any uniform standard arbitration procedure. So we don't have a particular design which means that different platforms have come up with their different designs that I'm going to talk about um, just very briefly um, in this presentation. But what you need to know is that what blockchain-based arbitration has introduced is basically streamlining the procedure, coding most aspects of the procedure, such as the arbitration contract, which is the arbitration agreement, and for example, the automated enforcement of the decision, which we call the arbitral award. So here you have an example of a procedural design by Code Legit. It's called the Code Legit Arbitration Procedure. And the way that it has been des designed is here on this diagram. 
So what the parties would do is obviously this is all um, based in code on the smart contract. And if the parties run into difficulties, say that would lead to a conflict, then um, the system itself would trigger the parties and the parties would choose whether um, they want to move on with the procedure, with the arbitration procedure. And this means that the arbitration library would trigger the arbitration. So the arbitration library is um, the arbitration agreement, basically, that is in code on the smart contract. And here, this means that the dispute resolution process can start and can be performed. And once it's over, there would be a decision. And this decision would then be sent to the smart contract, which, as you guessed it, means that the smart contract would run this and would implement and enforce the um, decision. So this means that there is an automated um, trigger and automated enforcement of the decision. So this can be quite interesting, um, for, especially for commercial arbitration and especially for those disputes that are low value, high volume. So if I can draw a parallel with um, consumer disputes that happen on the ODR platform on eBay or PayPal, um, the reason why these platforms have been successful um, is because simply they could deal with a lot of cases efficiently. So I'm assuming that, you know, the same could be applied for um, blockchain arbitration. So one of the advantages, obviously, efficiency because of the automation, saving time and cost. Um, and it's also a flex flexible procedure because the parties can choose how to design the procedure. It's obviously also confidential and secure more than using, you know, your usual um, online based um, platforms. However, there are limitations and quite a lot of concerns with that, um, especially from an access to justice perspective. So, OK, you have the data privacy issues, you have the security issues that are general for all types of blockchain arbitration, uh, blockchain um, based platforms or uses. Um, but the main problem, I would say, in dispute resolution, the use of blockchain in dispute resolution is the fact that it's a rigid procedure. I understand that you can work around with forks and um, find alternatives to the automated execution of the um, procedure, but there is still that automation um, concern. And as you can see here, I just <laughs> brought you one little example of the application of the law and how you know uh, blockchain-based arbitration um, is compliant with the current law on arbitration. So we have the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. That's the main legal instrument that is used in international arbitration. And the New York Convention is quite vague on this. So there's no specific um, provision in the New York Convention that allows or does not allow for an automated enforcement of uh, you know, the decision of the arbitration. Um, however, um, the New York Convention itself, as you can see from the slide here, in Articles 3 and 4, does refer us back to the national courts and the fact that the national courts have to verify the authenticity of the, um, of the decision of the arbitral award, and they are, it's up to them to basically um, implement it. So if you have an automated enforcement, you can see how this can conflict with that. And also, not all national um, laws allow for such an automated enforcement, I guess, simply because Articles 3 and 4 of the New York Convention, again, refer us back to those national courts. So in France, for example, it's first necessary to apply to court for the recognition of the um, arbitral decision, of the arbitral award. And this is, you know, the law, as you can see here, it's part of the French Code of Civil Procedure um, requirements. So you cannot just, you know, carry on with an automated enforcement under French law. So in conclusion, um, this is a book chapter I've written, and I've actually furthered it with further research. But just as a little conclusion here, um, as to whether, you know, or the extent to which blockchain arbitration provides or enhances better access to justice. In a way, yes, because automation helps with more efficiency. It offers the possibility to cut costs and deal with 
high volume, low value caseloads in a shorter time frame. So in a way, you know, that opens up um, more possibilities for smaller businesses, for example, to have access to this type of dispute resolution. So I would say it's relevant mostly for low value disputes in smart contracts and also emergency proceedings eventually. Um, but from a legal perspective, um, it is in compliance with some legal systems, not with others. And this could also affect the fairness of the procedure. So the automation and the fact that we don't have um, a particular design of automation can be um, a concern from a legal perspective. Obviously, I only have 10 minutes, so I cannot go into much detail. But if you have any questions about this, let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. That was very interesting. I think uh, the immediate benefits that you mentioned will be uh, automated enforcement, especially for small value transaction, high high volume. There is always the problem where you you need to do things uh, during emergency. I think all those are very clear. Uh, I have how do I have a question because when you think about arbitration, it's always about waiving costs and benefits of the different options made available to two parties. And here, the kind of options that is being available uh, in some ways is embedded in the coding, the code itself, since it's all automated. So I, I don't know how much, is it a challenge to look at the fairness of the code, uh, that the, the always the so-called feed principle of fairness, equitable, auditable, and then transparency of the code. Is that, do you see that? as a major hindrance of whether this feed principle can be abided by, by those people who are doing the coding? Are we transferring a lot more power to them? Or are that we have a lot more rooms to negotiate? You know, what do you think? Thank you very much. I think that's a very valid question. First of all, this is the paper I'm currently working on now. It's um, fairness and equity of these blockchain-based procedures um, for arbitration. Um, I would say that uh, from a fairness perspective, it, it does pose some concerns. That's why very careful consideration needs to be given to the um, automation, how it's implemented. Uh, so, for example, in the UK, um, and actually it's one of the first like state-based initiatives or state-supported initiatives that we've seen, um, we've had something called the UK Digital Dispute Resolution Rules that came out that were published in April. And they are rules that are... I would say, um, designed for blockchain-based um, um, transactions. So anything coming out of, you know, the usual uh, blockchain-based transactions. But also, it offers the possibility for parties to use this as a, a procedural um, for, I know, <laughs> automating dispute resolution or arbitration in particular. And what's interesting about um, the UK DDRR is that there are some aspects that are actually taken out. Like, for example, um, it offers the possibility for parties to, you know, keep on being anonymous, or um, it takes out the possibility for there to be a right to an oral hearing. Um, and this is actually in line with um, the other um, procedure designs of other platforms. Um, one of them that is very well known is um, called Kleros, or another one is called Jur. Um, so what's interesting about Claros on Jur is that the procedure itself is designed in a way that is quite different from the traditional arbitration process. So it's based around um, basically a system where you have jurors that are automatically um, selected by the system. Um, and the jurors would just have to make a yes or no vote to, you know, give you the, the um, final decision. Um, and there's no right to an oral hearing or there's no pleadings. Um, so this has been an issue in certain countries. This is considered not to be, um, you know, fair, but in others, um, it has been considered to be not a problem. Um, so yeah, it depends, I guess, on the national legal system in question. Um, but certainly I think that if you do have the right design perhaps you can come up with a, you know, with the right um, balance 
So Claras, I think, and Jura, they they're actually quite active in in this respect, and I think um, yeah, they're producing quite interesting um, ideas. Yeah, very very interesting. Very, I really learned a lot uh, about Clara and and Jared and and so on. I, I I think I'd like to learn more about it from you, and I'm, certainly I think with the low value uh, transactions and so on, it makes a lot of sense because it's low value anyway and it's so high frequency. So. Uh, something that uh, I think we have to start somewhere. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sarah. You. And I think we have the last uh, speaker, Mr. Matthias Hafner. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you very much, Professor. And thank you that I may present my work here. Let's just share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, you yes. can see it. Great, great, great. So um, I will present my work on uh, decentralized exchange platforms such as Uniswap. Just brief to myself, my name is Matthias. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Zurich and head of blockchain and cryptocurrencies at Swiss Economics and its research and consultancy platform Center for Cryptoeconomics. And we are based in the Crypto Valley in Switzerland. So uh, just to give you an overview, what I'm going to present, first I will introduce the research question, basically on which condition um, liquidity providers in those uh, decentralized exchanges make losses. Then I will tell a little bit about our met method, a Monte Carlo experiment based on uh, Uniswap data and um, conclude with our results. That is to say that impairment loss, so losses to liquidity providers only occurs if there are large price shocks that are persistent. So why, why, sh why should we care about decentralized exchanges on the first hand? Well, firstly, decentralized exchanges are a success story. In 2021, for example, the trading volume of DEXs amounted to more than 1 trillion US dollars. This is about the same size as the Swiss exchange, which plays for sure an important role in world's finance. Secondly, decentralized exchanges are very important for the entire DeFi ecosystem. Many traders, but also other protocols, rely on them. So it's important to understand them. So how do they work? Let's play, explain it with a, with a small illustration. Most decentralized exchanges work with, work with a liquidity pool, um, which traders may trade against it. So it's not that traders trade against other traders, as for example on, on, on centralized exchanges, or a trade against a, a human market maker. They trade against this liquidity pool and the liquidity pool consists of two or more tokens. And the traders, each time the traders make a transaction, they have to pay a fee to that liquidity pool. They can only trade if there is liquidity. So that means we need also liquidity providers. They provide two or more tokens to the liquidity pool and in return for, for um, these tokens that they, they provide, these assets, they receive a fee. Additionally, we have arbitrageurs. Um, the arbitrageurs come into play whenever the offered exchange rate from the liquidity pool deviates from the exchange rate that is on the market, the market exchange rate. Then they will make a trade such that those are equal again. Arbitrageurs also have to pay a fee that also go to the, to the liquidity provider. So very important here is that um, the liquidity pool only works, so this own entire system only works if um, liquidity providers can make a profit by providing tokens to the pool. So that's why we are, we are focusing on, on the profit and losses of liquidity providers. In particularly, many practitioners claimed that there exists this, this impermanent loss problem that means that liquidity providers make losses by providing liquidity. Um, and also um, decentralized exchange developers started to adjust their AMMs, so their liquidity pools, and address the impermanent loss problem directly, for example, with insurance solutions. However, if you look at Uniswap, which is uh, the most successful DEX, they did for a long time not adjust their protocol at all, and later, not targeted at impermanent loss. 
So somehow uh, this is um, a contradiction. So uh, on, the, on one hand, many practitioners claim that this is a huge problem. On the other hand, we see the success of Uniswap, um, which contradicts a little bit. So due to this discrepancy, we want to understand better what are the reasons for possible losses of liquidity providers. That means we analyze under which conditions um, the impermanent loss problem occurs. Um, or in other words, on the which condition it is better for a liquidity provider to buy the tokens and hold them versus to buy the tokens and provide them to a liquidity pool. So what has been analyzed so far? There are some working paper that directly or indirectly address the problem. To mention in part called Egno and Delival, who concluded that already a small change in the market exchange rate can result in impermanent loss. Also to mention uh, the working paper of Leher and Parler that created a theoretical model and in particular concluded that liquidity provider profit depends on the trade type. In particular, they show that innovation in one of the tokens re may result in impermanent loss. How do we contribute to this literature? Well, we analyze the problem with a Monte Carlo experiment. This allows us to come to dynamic setting, so in com contrast to the first paper, and we do not must um, make as strong assumption as the second paper with a complex theoretical equilibrium model. So how does our Monte Carlo experiment look like? Well, we basically um, simulate the actions of the different actors I have shown you before. As a baseline, we use uh, for the simulation, we use on-chain data from the Ether tether pool of Uniswap V2 in 2021. Then we randomize the demand to a certain degree. For each of the trade, we update the state of the protocol. It means that we also simulate the protocol itself and because it's, it's a simple design, um, it's easy to, to implement that. And check of each trade whether there is an arbitrage opportunity for the arbitrageur or not. If so, the arbitrageur comes into play and the AMAME, the liquidity pool, will update a second time. Now we analyze different, we change different factors um, of these different actors and look um, how, uh, analyze how that affects the, the, the return of the liquidity provider. So this is also our results. So as a first thing, we change the trading volume. So we look at what happens if we have more traders on the liquidity pool. And as expected, as you can see here, more uh, trading volume means that the return of the liquidity provider increases. Why is that? Because if we have more trading volume, there are more fees and more fees means more profit for liquidity provider. Similar, um, we can show that an increase in the size of the liquidity pool decreases the liquidity provider's return. So now more interesting is the relationship between the arbitrageurs and the liquidity pool. Um, and we did not increase the number of arbitrageurs. What we did is we, we changed the input and the input is the market exchange rate. So the arbitrageur will retrade whenever the exchange rate in the market, the market exchange rate deviates from the one that is offered by the liquidity pool. Hence, we changed, we, 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 we um, changed the, the, the trend of it. Meaning um, you can imagine like uh, you have here Ethereum and Tether. So we assumed that Ethereum would have grown stronger than it was actual. And surprisingly, we do not see an effect on return for liquidity providers. And um, surprisingly, because previous literature and practitioner would say so. And um, so a stronger trend in the exchange rate does not affect liquidity providers return significantly. So what happens if we model an instant adjustment of the exchange rate instead of a slow adjustment? So the trend adjustment that we see before. Thus, we implemented different exchange rate shocks for Ether in our data. That means an increase from one second to another by 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on, as you can see here. And we see now these impermanent losses, those uh, uh, the, the points below zero. So that means if we have a shock, a fast adjustment of the exchange rate, then we see that losses that previous literature would, would, uh, would uh, uh, say so. So why do we have this difference between this and this basically? So well, 
the reason is that the profit um, of the arbitrageur is the loss of the liquidity providers from a change in the liquidity pool. However, the arbitrageurs also pay a fee that may offset these losses. So if the profit of the um, arbitrageur is larger than um, the, the fee, then we have a permanent loss. So it basically de de depends how fast the adjustments in the exchange rate happen. And as you can see, only if it's very, very fast, we have a permanent loss, and otherwise we don't have a permanent loss. So basically, this is then our, our finding that um, for a permanent loss to occur, we need a large shock of the exchange rate um, that is persistent. And um, the interpretation would then be that, that conditions are not met frequently and the impermanent loss problem is less pronounced than stated. Um, yeah, and uh, what, what, what could be a solution for AMMs is to compensate, this could be a problem for new or very illiquid tokens where we have more price shocks and you could there compensate for these certain types of tokens with risk or discriminate between different cryptocurrencies or just restrict access to liquidity pool for large uh, shifts in the exchange rate. So thank you very much. That's it. So I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much, Matthias. It's very interesting to look into this area, uh, especially uh, the relationship among the trader, arbitrager, as well as liquidity provider. I was looking at your last sentence. I'm just trying to understand. Because from your research, uh, you were just saying that um, I also the general um, understanding is that if there are more liquidity provider, then perhaps uh, if there's a lot more uh, traders as well, then it will be the case where this impermanent loss will not uh, be so large. But however, your last sentence is to restrict uh, access to liquidity pool. Is there any reason behind that? Can you explain a little bit more for me to understand? Yes, sure, yes, sure. So uh, basically it's not to restrict liquidity to come into the pool. So you should never restrict liquidity coming into the pool. The idea behind is to say, well, like what, what's also implemented in Uniswap v, v3 version three is to say you're only, the liquidity pool only trades between a certain um, amount of exchange rates. So for example, if you have the market price now is at one, it only exchange between 1.05, 5% plus and 5% minus. Um, so that if there would be a strong increase, a strong new element that increased the exchange rate very strong, that you're not allowed that that um, these profits don't go out. Just then, then the liquidity pool would not, uh, you cannot trade the liquidity pool in cases where there are strong increases of the market exchange rate. That's the intuition behind it. Right, right. So is, is this similar a little bit to a circuit breaker in that sense? And do you have any, I mean, there's restriction. Is there any time horizon that you're thinking about? No, 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 no. I think that that's that, that's difficulty in, in in implementing it. So how how do you? So then, when you restrict it, then you need to adjust the um, the the price. Basically, the, this these boundaries you need right. to adjust them all the time. But we didn't look at the time horizon. That depends basically or mostly on the willingness of the liquidity providers to um, adjust those boundaries. Um, how often they are can do that basically yeah yeah thank you very much i think you point to a very important point that uh, liquidity is a major factor in any of this DeFi platform that uh, the impact could be much more than we can imagine at this moment and it's therefore important to pay a little bit more attention and there's no guarantee that liquidity uh, or volume will always be there thank you very yeah. much matthias uh, for Thank you. Uh, giving us the insight to your research, especially with all the simulation and so on. Uh, sh uh, because of the timing issue, I will have to pass back uh, to our chair. Thank you very much for inviting me and, uh, and, and thank you once again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you to all the abstract researchers. I wish you all the best. Excellent presentations. I really enjoyed them.
um david please do send uh, the scores via email to us and um, uh, the final scores please uh, yeah. we will announce the 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 winners of the best abstracts uh, at um, uh, 4 430 just before 430 425 um so thank you very much all uh, for joining and uh, we look uh, forward to seeing you in the next sessions thank you thank you david thank well, you the next session is at 11 o'clock in 10 minutes time 10 minutes time thank you yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much thank you bye 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 thank, thank you. you bye 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 so i think um brian are you here we can i think we can end this session and go backstage for the next one yeah murid yes we can uh, yeah we can end this one yeah